Okay, uh, well, thank you for coming uh, at this relatively late hour of the day. The title of the talks is actually, uh, is not very easy to handle because what you have is you have two sides of the talk. One of them is discovering and the second one is the obvious. Now, which side do you want to be at? Do you want to be at the discovery side or do you want to be at the obvious side? So it is a little bit, uh, uh, it's not that easy to handle. So what I will do is I will try to make sure that I follow what is the general trend at TED talks in general. But I will also uh, try to make sure that my message is for ordinary people. Today I will put aside all the uh, uh, researchers that we are used to talk about at the university environment and I will talk about ordinary people who most of them are the students of today and who will become ordinary people and most of us are actually ordinary so I will try to understand what is happening what will happen to these ordinary people in the coming let's say any years so this, this will be what I want to talk about okay so this is basically discovering the obvious 101, or because we, we are sort of instructors, and this is for ordinary people. Okay. Now, I would like to start with science fiction. I am not very much fond of reading science fiction or watching science fiction, but of course, in, in, in my young age, I have watched a number of science fiction movies and read a number of science fiction novels. Now, what drives science fiction is very straightforward. Science fiction is driven by imagination, it is driven by expectations, and it is driven by hopes. You see, uh, sometimes you cannot expect something, but it is hope that drives you when you are writing science fiction. Now, what is the key issue in science fiction movies or novels is that key is knowledge. We are going to come to a stage where we will have vast knowledge about things that are going on in the universe, not only in the world, but in the universe. And we are going to have fancy gadgets to make our life easy. So this is actually what we expect from, from the movie. Of course, better movies have, or better novels have values. They, have, they talk about values that goes on. And the values are usually centered around one, two ideas. For example, sometimes it is centered around the fact that people are going to live healthy. Or they claim that they found the, uh, uh, the vaccine for happiness. Okay? So these are actually few values, like make the whole society happy and so on. But in general, it is based on what we call and what we define technology in these days. So it is basically something that uh, drives technology. So I was curious and tried to understand what is there for ordinary people in science fiction novels or movies. Now, amazingly, uh, internet, of course, when you look at the internet, you're going to see a number of different approaches to this. I have even read a number of articles which say that Science fiction actually hates ordinary people. Because basically in most of those novels and movies, what you have is you have sort of like the leader doing something or the explorer exploring something and so on. So this is actually one thing that we should start with. So I will be talking about the future. So I want to look a place for these ordinary people and that place is probably not available in the science fiction part. Now, of course, there are some gloomy science fiction novels and, and movies, and there are some darker side of science fiction. Now, I don't want to get into that, but there is very little for ordinary people other than being soldiers and, and, and so on. So, this is actually one motivation that uh, uh, initiated what I am I will be talking about. Now, currently, we are living at an age where technology is driving our daily lives. And it is very obvious that most of the old habits are being replaced. 
So if you, if for example, I may not want to replace some of my old habits, then I am, of course, old-fashioned. So a number of things are now being replaced, and this is inevitable. Now, they are replaced because our lives are becoming easier to, to live. So coming and, and being, having a transportation facility, or having a subway, let's say, is making our lives easy. Or having the economic position of buying a car is making our lives easy. A number of things are easier than it used to be, and then we, of course, this is mostly a, 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 as a result of technology. Now, in education, we have the same trend as well. It's been almost 20, 25 years where, uh, in education, we started to have new modes of education. For example, we have distance learning. We have flipped classrooms. We have other things which uh, is are numerous in number, and they are all very helpful. But this is basically what we are having in these days. Now, coming to the word of uh, to, to universities, I read this, uh, most of you have heard about this Times Higher Education. Uh, uh, I think it's, it's an organization which uh, simply does a number of uh, ranking issues among different universities. So what they would do is they would sometimes bring some experts into picture and they ask their opinion about what will happen to universities in 2030. So this is actually <coughs> something that was very recently published in at the web, of course. And the one opinion that we have there is, uh, in terms of the way that technology is developing, they are expecting, some, some of the experts are expect, uh, expe expecting that some of the jobs that we have in these days, like some engineering jobs, even some judiciary jobs, are going to be replaced by robots. So most of the talent that we, I am seeing here is going to have their jobs replaced by robots. Now, this is understandable. For example, dentists are going to become robots because we already have a lot of operations being done by, automatically by robots. Now, this is actually one thing that immediately brings into mind the following. What are we going to do with ordinary people if this is the case? So what are they going to do? They might enjoy themselves, which is nice or they might go and do horseback riding or swim or whatever. Everything is nice, but is wealth is going to be sufficient to accommodate all of these possibilities? We don't know that, but this is something that is uh, definitely going to be an important question. Now, I looked at the uh, statistics regarding tertiary education. Tertiary education includes universities, but it also includes any education that we have post-secondary. So it can be a, a, a two-year year higher education school, or it can be an extraordinarily uh, high-level uh, university, or even like PhD schools, research environments, and so on. Now, it is usually used as an indicator of, for welfare. So we have around 43 countries in the statistics that I have seen. It includes OECD countries plus some others. So I looked at the percentage of the population who has tertiary education degree. Okay, this is the percentage. So the percentage among the ages of 25 to 64 ranges between 7% to 54% in these 43 countries. So this is sort of the, the ranking of the countries, 43 countries. So Canada, Russia, Israel, Luxembourg are at the top. They, they, they are over like 50%, and the others are in the bottom. Now, what these countries are trying to do is simply, they, they are trying to increase this percentage. So this is what's happening, actually. Welfare is, that's the way that welfare is helping us. Now, let's look at, the, the numbers, these are the numbers, but we have to look at the 
the issues that go beyond those numbers. Now, what, are, what is this education for? Usually, it turns out that the additional education possibilities that we are having around the world are usually based on skill-oriented issues. Okay, for example, computer engineers or software engineers or, or uh, air traffic controllers or they are all very specific skill-based positions and you see the, 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 the question here is that most of these are going to be replaced by robots and we are now paying for all these higher education positions and still uh, it is probably going to be removed in 15, 20 <coughs> years. Now, on the other hand, you have a handful of very good institutions. This is true everywhere almost. Entering desired institutions are end-oriented. You want to enter that institution regardless of what you want to do. Okay? But the values and means of doing that is less important. So we don't actually learn. We aim different positions. Remember, in the beginning of the TED talk, we had the same thing. We had some aims. Actually, we don't, it's not that easy to fill the inside. Now, that based education is actually uh, is increasing those numbers in a number of countries, which is good because we want the ordinary people to have access to uh, education, but there is a certain limit in that. Now, on the internet, this is basically as an example. We have incredible benefits of social media. I mean, it is really hard to say that social media is, is useless. And it turns out that, uh, for example, uh, post-disaster issues can much efficiently and effectively handled by social media. We, we learned that, actually. A number of different things that are in the interest of a lot of people can be handled by social media. Of course, we have the dark side of social media as well, which is privacy, piracy, and trustworthiness. <coughs> okay? In other words, there are a lot of other things in the, uh, uh, which I will call dark side. Now, the question here is that academicians have as their own small world. We have our publications. Our publications are uh, reviewed. And before it is published, it takes like two years, actually, of different people's work. Make sure that everything is correct inside. Now, most of the newspaper, like New York Times, is trying to do the same thing. They want to make sure that anything that they print or put it at the web is double-checked, triple-checked, and so on. Now, how about social media? Now, we are using this social media in an, in an enormous amount. And I can understand why. It is sort of like a... Hey. Now, some of you may know uh, the, the book by uh, Chomsky and Herman on manufacturing concept, which is the political economy of the mass media. It basically argues the fact that mass media is manufacturing, producing the concept among people. And so it means that they are directing everybody what to think, how to think, and so on. So this is basically a work which was published in 88. Now, of course, with the internet and with the social media, now you have the same thing in the internet, not only done by a group of known uh, media, mass media, but by everybody, actually. So, uh, for example, Googling, the title of the article that came out in New York Times is Googling is, uh, is Believing. So if you don't believe anything you Google, and at the end, you, if you see it there, you say, oh, it's correct. And, but of course, who wrote that information there? And this is basically connected to trumping the informed citizen, where Trump is we are all, we, it's one of the candidates for US presidency. And trumping at the same time means that tricking. It's, so it's basically trumping the informed citizen. So that's the trump. So, what is in it then for ordinary people? For ordinary people, we, my, my approach is very simple actually, and naive maybe. We're going to have tertiary educational institution. That's obvious we are going to need that. Ordinary people needs to be more educated at their mature age. 
not before that, not before that can be as well, but at their mature, mature age where they are deciding for themselves at an age where, th where they can decide for themselves. And ordinary people should be sort of, uh, should understand the importance of judgment and truth seeking. In other words, we will be judging whatever we read in the social media. It is practically impossible to control the social media and we don't want to do that. And, but we can have our own filters and this boils down to the critical thinking abilities in, in, a, mature, in a mature environment for people. So my understanding of future universities would be higher education institutions, which is going to give this judgment to, their, uh, to the students. And moreover, uh, basically, uh, I'm hoping that the organization of this university in 2035 is going to utilize social media's advantages that we are having today. Now, social media's advantages, you can come together with a number of people that you don't know. Why not physically do that? It might be very easy to, make, to, to transport some people from one location to another. But physically coming together is going to increase trustworthiness of certain things, the things that you believe and so on. So this is actually what I understand. So the offer is simply 12 years of education up to the secondary, plus you can have a three or four year of additional education, which I call not only liberal arts, but liberal, liberal arts and sciences, which is going to uh, simply not teach anybody any skill. We are not going to be software engineers with this, but we are going to be educated and we will be able to live together in an environment where we can judge and and we can actually understand each other. So this is, this is the expectation that I have. <coughs> now, of course, this should be public, meaning that the wealth that we are going to obtain from technologies and other things should be transferred for ordinary people for this purpose. Thank you.